on the Museum of Jewish Heritage's Board of Trustees before becoming president and CEO of the museum in 2019. He currently serves in that role and has overseen the opening of the museum's groundbreaking Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. So please welcome Jack Friedman. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, sorry for my pain. I'm still recovering from some uh, knee surgery, but uh, I promise I'll be dancing pretty soon. Bob, thank you for the lovely word. I, I thought I was at my memorial service. <laughs> but I also think the way you invited me is very interesting. Um, Bob uh, called me a couple of weeks ago and said, Dad, I'd like to ask you a question. You've been publishing this for a long time. Do you believe in free speech? I said, Absolutely. I said, Good. Could you give one to our group? Well, I'm glad we're able to host you. Um, you're, you're, you're a great group, the guys in the city. You're really dedicated, in my opinion. We have a lot in common with what our mission is. Um, our museum, which is dedicated in 1997, it's over 25th year program, um, is dedicated to two missions, two pillars, remembrance and education. Remembrance of the six million who are lost and three million who survived, and education for current and future generations. And to learn the history of what they can do, not only what they did, but what they can do, and to understand the responsibility to help heal the world and be taking care of others. So this is a good place for you to come to have your annual meeting. I'm very glad to host you. Also in a brand new, brand new newly renovated Evan J. Sackler Hall. We just did a, a major renovation, thanks to the nation from the foundation. And uh, we will be opening back for live performances by December. Uh, an actress named Philip Pelch is doing a long winter show about the kind Dr. Ruth. Uh, welcome to the And as a very old film that we can you know, unveil this new opera and talk this partnership with New York City Opera, the Combat and Version of our Prince of Conti. And then in March, when we open a new musical written by a man named Barry Mallet. About an acapella singing group in Berlin in 1930. So we have a lot of interesting cultural activities, but at the core of our mission is really education. As much as anything, we are charged as an education institution by the state board of regents. Um, prior to COVID, we had an average of 60 to 70,000 students coming through the institution, mainly in the eighth and tenth grades, uh, mainly not Jewish. To learn about history and to learn the lessons of history. So, as such, um, I think we have a lot in common with what you're going to be teaching people about New York. I see that you all know New York as well as anybody who heard that I grew up in Brooklyn and then visited a foreign country in the Bronx every once in a while. <laughs> Need a passport for that. Um, but for most of my uh, adult life, I, I've lived here in the city. And um, I got involved when I was in the poetry business with the museum. Um, at first, just doing odd jobs and assignments, but then they invited me to be on board of trustees. And eventually that led to this role. Or as my mother said, I finally got a job with dignity. <laughs> um, this is the most enjoyable, challenging position I've ever had. I am I'm honored to be a child of survivors, but that is not just an honor, it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility to future generations, teach lessons of history. And in doing such, we do programs, we do performances, we educate, and at the core is to have exhibitions that bring history to life in a three dimensional form. As you know, we did the Africa exhibit about two years ago, and we will shortly be opening up new exhibitions starting. 
So I invite you to help people in New York discover what we are about and to discover the mission we fulfill. And we hope that you will be able to bring people by uh, as much as possible. I want to just close with one little anecdote about what we're going to do this fall. Um, sounds like a pretty weird thing for a museum to do, but we're planting a tree. And we have lots of trees that come together. Garden of Stones with 18 trees that were planted in memory of the six million that were lost. But this December, we're going to transplant a tree from Philadelphia. It's a 15 foot silver maple tree that has a very interesting history. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Terrain's that. Yeah. It was in Europe, which is like the Terrain's that was a model camp that the Nazis set up to show the Red Cross and others that they were treating um, people, women, and children um, well, when in fact it was just a show, and they would transport them shortly after that, mainly children, women, teachers. Um, and Important to know that 15,000 children went through the Red Mesa and 200 of them took lives. But there was a teacher there named Erna Lasher who decided that she would do something with her students to commemorate the Jewish holiday of uh, Shabbat, which is the festival of the Marble Trees. So she bribed um, the Czechoslovakian guard at the Red Mesa in 1943 to smuggle in a uh, sapling. From a tree in the dealer's booth, and she and the children uh, conducted a secret ceremony. So I see them, and they planted the tree, and they made sure that they nurtured the tree with water, which was from their own production, and they actually were able to grow the tree. Um, those children didn't survive, but the teacher did, and she came back after a while. She made a promise, she made a pledge. That I will see the cutting from this tree go to various parts of the world. And over the next 30, 40 years, they've been planted in various parts of Jerusalem, San Francisco, and things like that. But there was never a tree planted in New York. So, um, through, the, uh, through the offices of one of our colleagues, we talked to a guy in Philadelphia who actually had had eight of the cuttings transplanted and planted them in his gentleman's farm. Um, he said that it was long in. Commemorative institutions and one where people can see it, and finally agreed to donate two of the trees. One of them to us, and that'll be the tree that will be in New York. So in December of uh, this year, we will have a transplanting tree from Philadelphia, right here in front of the museum. And uh, I welcome you all to come see it and we made an agreement with the School across the street, PS 276, so the children there will help nourish and maintain the tree in honor of the children of the Riverside. So I think that there are many stories. I mean, you heard that I was in the publishing business, and it really is about telling stories and content and creating stories for people to understand. We get stories every day, we hear amazing stories inspirational stories, magic stories. But what we are at the end of the day is storytelling. Like you, you tell the story in New York. And we're a very important part of New York to the permanent memorial, to the Holocaust here in the largest city of the outside of New York. We sit at the triangle facing Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. We celebrate not only remembrance, but the resilience, resistance, renewal. And so it's really important for us that we have local ambassadors. We have internal ambassadors who can pull gallery educators who are our docents. But to us, you're our ambassador to tell the story of the museum to the people you take it through and let them understand that not only the lessons of history, but the teachings of it. So I thank you all for having your meeting here. I'm very glad you're here in the theater. I'm glad that you know the museum a little better. And I'm sure you'll be able to do us proud and sharing our story and our values with those in the picture. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jack. It was really wonderful to, um, to be acknowledged in that way. And I know, guys, we appreciate uh, when people see what we do and recognize our work, how important it, it really is. So, um, that lovely speech, I'm, I'm going to give my report now. Just a few remarks, just a, a quick sort of summary of what we've been doing over the past uh, 12 months. And uh, our last meeting was online with a wonderful Zoom gallery of my um, downstairs study in New Jersey and all of you, your respective places. So, so again, it's wonderful to see some of you here in person um, this evening. And so we really had another um, remarkable, we had a remarkable year. I mean, they, of course, the pandemic has influenced and changed every day in all of our lives. And I have to admit, things did look a little bleak last winter, but um, we kept working for our members the entire time. And uh, I hope you all have seen how much we've done and how willingly, willingly we do this and keep working. Board and the committee, all the inspiration and the, the energy that keeps us going. So, um, last fall and early winter, we did start, I think we started our first uh, in person fan tours and following our health and safety guidelines. And um, my idea for this um, for the sort of little summary of what we did is also to highlight how much you all do as well. And I think one of the best things to come out of uh, last fall and early winter was the wonderful series of events at 150 that Cameron Lawrence helps you uh, bring into. The videos, you can see them online, and it was just a great celebration of one of our institutions. Um, in January, we had um, the first World Guild of many collaborations with the DC Guild, and in our inauguration, we had a day dedicated to the history of inaugurations in starting in New York, but then also in Washington, DC, and we hope to be working more with the Guild in the future. In February, we celebrated International Tourist Guide Day with a full day of panels from, uh, panels from around the world. And then we also celebrated with our wonderful Apple Awards, our first virtual and our seventh annual Apple Awards. And uh, I did miss in getting dressed up. I could get dressed up with a drop and a half. But it was also good because this was to be sitting at home, <laughs> my yoga pants, and just watching it. With cocktails, especially with my son's into making cocktails for me. So <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun. So in March, um, we had the another virtual con uh, conference, the uh, World Federation of Tourist Guide Association, with AWSGA. Um, several days, um, wonderful time um, from around the world. But the great thing was, so many GAC members attended. Um, I think out of all the associations, we had one of the highest numbers of, of attendees. So. That was also very good to see. And then as the vaccine thing had rolled out, I just can't tell you how wonderful it was to see how many of you posting your tours, your live tours, your public tours. And people started giving around the public tours. And in May, of course, we had a wonderful guide week that my board helped to organize. And um, that was just three fantastic days of education, networking, and recruitment. And the first ever of this kind, really dedicated to local guides. And then we started our summer with the first, our first in-person um, happy hour on a wonderful, very warm um, June night. So um, throughout the year, yeah, what really makes us work, what really keeps us going, is all our dedicated volunteers to keep our members informed, educated, and prepared for the future. Um, fan of PDP, to conferences and classes, I, I think every month we've offered something for you and to continue to provide you with different ways to improve yourself as a guide and also to continue this great community uh, toward guides. And this is something that we can only do actually thanks to all of you. As you'll see, we'll go through the budget. Our budget comes from membership dues. And you know, there's no hiding that did lose the members. So last year, people who had not been able to renew for various reasons, other people who chose not to renew. But we also have seen many new members, and that's been the most gratifying. Every single month, the board and the membership committee, led by Gary Chan, have interviewed new members. So people are coming to Ghana, people still want to join us. So um, 
We really urge you to renew and renew your starts in November to continue to participate in GANA and to continue um, to, to show your support and to sign that GANA is on the right track. So we've done a lot. And the reason we did so much is yes, our committees, yes, our volunteers, but most of all, the GANIC board. Um, so I, I want to come in front of the microphone, in front of the screen, and we all talking. They do all the work, and they really do. And I cannot tell you how wonderful this board is. And so, can I say your name? Please stand up so you can make it known. So first of all, our Vice President, Bob Gelber. Remember, <laughs> Chair of the Installation Committee and also co organizer of the wonderful 9 11 event. So, thank you, Bob. Next, our other Vice President, Mike Morgenthal. <laughs> the other Vice Chair of the Installation Committee and organizer of our widely successful um, guide group, Recording Secretary Patrick Casey. Sarah Government Relations Committee, part of the Health and Safety Committee, a member of the Education and Certification Committees, plus he has a new copy. So, <laughs> our correspondent, yeah. oh, and that is too, and our corresponding secretary, John Selma, who is the chair of the Health and Safety the Education and Health Relations Committee, and he's getting his online degree from history, so, but John as well. I am, of course, Jeremy Wilcox, who will be speaking. Jeremy is the chair of public relations. He's part of the education membership communities. Um, he runs all of them at social media. He keeps track of while we're looking for um, registrations, waiting and fees. And I, I think Jeremy you must be at least three times a week, if not more. I'm always texting Jeremy or Facebook. We're always back and forth. Please, just can be my wrong. And finally, our members at large, Deborah Cloud, and they are all members of several committees, including education, certification, constitution, membership, cover population, and they're always ready to step up and help in any way they can. And so, thanks to the board, thanks to our committee chairs and members, our organization. A strong thanks to all of your work. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, please renew. Please bring more people together. We're as strong as you make us. And um, join other committees if you want. You can notice all our board members are also on committees. They need help. Everybody we always need help. So if you can and when you can participate, we really appreciate it. So that's it for me. I uh, thank you all and look for um, look forward to another. Great year and was all together once again, and hopefully with many more live in person meetings together. And so, um, we're going to start with our committee reports. And our first report will be from the awards committee. So, Matt Baker would like to come up. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Like everyone, I'm just very, very happy and again here to be able to see and hug so many friends to my love. Really, just a couple minutes ago, Jack Peter said that when he heard Bob's words, it sounded like he was at his memorial. If, as we go into the Gannon Capital Awards eighth year, there is still anyone who asks, why do we have awards? That's the reason. So that we can thank and honor people for their achievements while they're still here. With that in mind, the 2021 Gannon Capital Awards were held virtually online due to COVID. After much consideration, the committee has determined to do the same with the 2022 awards. While people both within the association and without are weary of online events, the future is too uncertain, and the new move variant to dangerous and the budget requirements at a time when membership is struggling too heavily in flux for any other decision to make sense. Uh, considering that, the committee has approached this coming season with the intent of learning from the pros and cons of 
what the last season brought us. Most notably, our busy celebrity guests, such as Bill Ritter and Norman Torrey, and Martin Samuelson and Robert Creighton, wouldn't have been available for a live show, uh, and filming in advance made it possible for them to participate. So we will be similarly concentrating on our key names whose presence will draw an audience, uh, but who will find the relaxed schedule to be a plus for their involvement. On the flip side, uh, while the Livestorm platform made for easy and convenient cross-cutting between the pre-recorded presentations and the live acceptances, the technical difficulties for anyone trying to access that platform is something of a deal breaker. So we are going to be investigating other possibilities in terms of how to get this thing webcast to you. Um, the committee has reached out to our industry partner, Dabar Media, for advice on how to improve our gala, as they are the company that produces the highly successful uh, Concierge Choice Awards each year. And they have already uh, told us our committee is too small. We have seven wonderful members, several of whom have already been named tonight. The others, we know who you are and we love your work. But uh, they, their awards committee ranges between 12 and 15 uh, active workers, and we have half that. So please, if you are even remotely interested, our committee needs members. We especially need people who can help us with things like the new platform, assisting and maintaining contact lists with the participants in the hopes of having them back as audience and as advertisers, and with uh, basic administrative matters. We don't necessarily need people with a background in event producing, uh, as we definitely have that covered. But if you do have such a background, please don't feel that that means you're not welcome. What we need is people who love this stuff and want to do it with us. Uh, I like when I was president, I always used to say the first prerequisite for accomplishing a task is the willingness to do it. So please, if you're at all interested, come and join our committee. It is a lot of work, but it is also a lot. Uh, the pre nominations survey for you know, submitting suggestions for possible nominations went out today. Thank you, Jeremy Gokas, uh, for that. Uh, everyone should have received the email this morning with a Google form. Uh, which you may be open and revisit as often as you wish to propose potential nominees in each category. Uh, this is the one type of voting that provisional members are allowed to do. So please vote. In November, the committee will gather uh, the proposals and narrow them down to the final four nominees in each category. Then a one time only ballot will be sent out for you all to vote on the final minutes. Descriptions of the categories are now included in the ballot to assuage any potential confusion as to the type of achievement being honored or the type of criteria for which the honors are chosen. Uh, that survey will also be posted later on tonight on the GANIC members' Facebook page and the announcements on the GANIC website. Uh, the only awards over which the committee has full discretion without a membership are the honorary awards that are announced ahead of time, the Lifetime Achievement Award and the Lee Gelder Award for Guiding Spirit. Uh, we are currently courting a short list of highly renowned workers uh, for Lifetime Achievement, uh, but the Guiding Spirit Award uh, was chosen already and it was a uh, unanimous uh, decision. Uh, and that was someone who I served on the board with for three terms. We were co vice presidents and then he continued to serve as vice president when I was president, uh, and the committee unanimously said that this year's uh, guiding spirit is the three Harvey Paul Davidson. Harvey, you know? And uh, that's what we presented to him by the gentleman who took over the uh, industry relations committee from him, as Mike Morgan told me to all know. Uh, the webcast will be at 8 p.m. on Monday, February 21st, which is International Tourist Guide Day. Uh, for further questions, concerns, suggestions, or to join the committee, please contact me at awards at Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any quick questions for Matt while he's selected? Okay. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. All right. So next we have certification and my own village of Howdy, everybody. Uh, I'm going to ask the committee members to come on now because we are going to be giving certificates to our recent graduates and we try to get a group photo. So 
And there was a certification that you could come down and join us. They are Patrick Casey, Robin Gard, Kip Garrett, Kevin Lawrence, Nina Mende, William Downing, and Jonathan Turr. And they recognize these names because they do more than one thing. So we're going to get this and take the news. So if you're here, come on down so that when you get the uh, certificates out, you'll be here for the photo. So, of course, COVID to us a real curveball. We have just finished our first session of 2020 when the shutdown happened. And so we had to figure out what to do. We did some online stuff in 2020. But for 2021, as the COVID shutdown continued, we realized we had to do more. And so we spent months working every week to create a full online program so that uh, GANIC members might want to avail themselves with this and get ready for as soon as opened up, they could uh, we'd have a program to offer for them. And uh, we launched that in, in late spring. It ran from April 26th to June 14th. And there were online sessions and we did three in-person practicums as well. And the final project was submitted to the committee on June 30th. Initially, there were nine members who signed up for the program. Some of them had to drop out because uh, of personal commitments. We ended up with the six state with the program fully, four of them successfully completed the program. A couple of them have to um, just finish up some work before they can be certified. And we had one member from an earlier program that had not certified and completed certification uh, in this term, so we're very excited about that as well. Uh, let's see. So also, what we were able to launch in 2020 was um, the program where guys have to maintain their certification and they have to uh, do a certain amount of work. Even with the COVID shutdown, almost everybody was able to recertify. There were a handful of members that did not renew their GAG membership. And so they didn't participate in way. We're not sure the committee will have to deal with that if and when they renew their GAG membership. But as of right now, we have about 41 certified guys in GAG right now as of August. And the successful participants are, and you can come down through here and get your certificate. We have Amy Cook. We have Gary Dennis. If you have any questions about the certification program, you can speak to anyone from the committee or any of these members who successfully completed the program. Incredible amount of work they've all done. Some business that kind of tangentially applies to the Constitution Committee. 
uh, there was a recent change to the bylaws that was made. Uh, it would have been announced at the July general meeting. Uh, we had our open comments period following that announcement to the bylaws change, or the bylaws in the Constitution, uh, and there was no commentary. Uh, so this change to the bylaws has passed, and it affects all of you. It's something you should all keep in mind. Uh, you will not be receiving ballots by mail. Instead, all of our uh, elections from here on out are going to be performed online. And this is essentially a uh, work smarter, not harder initiative. It should make life a lot easier for all of you in terms of voting for your preferred candidates. Uh, and keep your eyes open uh, for your email for future ballots. Anybody has any questions? I can answer them. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for the Jonathan, who are a member of the Constitution Committee. So, next we have um, for the Ethics Committee, Patrick Lucy will be, um, sorry, the Education Committee, Bob McKellar will be um, recording the Education Committee. So, um, I'm leaving this tonight uh, for our Channing Amanda, who couldn't be here with us, but I know she's watching and I just wanted to thank her for all of the support and hard work. Nina has been chair of the Education Committee for probably a decade or longer, and as most of you know, she's also a GAG Apple Awards Guiding Spirit winner. So, here we go. Education Corps report. The Education Committee was asked recently by the Executive Board to make a list of all of its functions, missions, etc. So we will be part of the Committee Guide for GAG members. Kevin Lyons, Education Corps Committee member and board member of large, is serving as the scribe for this project. The goal is for all committees to streamline our mission statements, say our scope and tasks. So we can pass on this information to future chairs and community members. We're not to focus on who we are as individual members, but what we do. I realize that this would be a valuable document. However, it's Google or art that gives gang its juice. Our education contributors and core members bring unique and diverse points of view to all that we do. So the drum roll, we wrote this I did, for the who's who of the education committee. Uh, first of all, our board members, uh, in order of seniority, so I come first and so vice versa. Uh, then we have Jeremy Wilcox, our treasurer, the man with the credit card, very important to know him. John Selleck, our secretary, and Kevin Lawrence. Uh, board member at large, long time members, Susan Burnham, Nick Shaw, Lisa Puccio, and our newest member, Irene Rourke, and our emeritus member, Andrea Coyle, who we hope will join us once again soon. Our hardworking team of committee members and contributors brought you 55 can fan tours in person or virtual during the last 12 months. Two day trips at town, of course, to the Mario Cuomo Bridge, which was organized by Mark Lennon, and historic bus tour of Newark, organized by Andy Seidler and Mark Lennon, four professional development programs, preparedness, Red Cross, resume writing, marketing, which was a three part series, and the 11 months of guest speakers at our membership meeting. In addition, Kevin Lawrence and Bob Dilber worked on a subcommittee to commemorate the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Next year, we will do it all over again. For whatever we're budgeted, we'll do four PDPs, two bus trips, and as many fan trips as all of our generous members are willing to give us their time and their energy and all of their knowledge. Also, special thanks to our extended family of organizations 
that a nurturing education contributors, the adventure club, Valley Boys, James Walks, and the Mystic Art Society. Special thank you to Arthur Susan Zuckerman for their many Zooms on New York City topics and members. And not being read by me tonight, six pages of 55 different programs that the education committee worked on because of everyone's generosity. And these will all be posted on the website. So thank you, Nina, and thank you to our group. Okay, next we have the Ethics Committee, and Patrick Casey will be reporting on behalf of Susan Burnham. Hey, hello, everybody. I am really just thrilled to see everybody in person. I miss you all. I really have. Thank you for being here. All right, first and foremost, I do want to acknowledge the members of the Ethics Committee, our chair, Susan Burbaugh, and members Matthew Baker, Michael Brennan, Daniel Ellis, Riley Kellogg, and Jonathan Brewer. The Ethics Committee of the Guides of the Guides Association of New York City had a very quiet year due to COVID-19 effect on the tourism industry. We received only one complaint from the tourists about a tour provider. Not our job. We just directed them to the appropriate city agency. Uh, but the Ethics Committee does continue uh, to serve the GAC membership by promoting the high standards of professionals within the GAC community. The committee supports adherence to the GAC codes of ethics, which if you haven't reviewed it, can be found with the bylaws and the Constitution on our webpage. We have mediated in the past conflicts between guides and tour operators, guides and clients, and sorry to say once in a while between guides. But that said, it is not about enforcement, it's about cooperation, it is about collaboration, and every day working to raise the standards of the best guys in what truly is the greatest city in the world. As we make our way back to our profession, we navigate COVID-19 in the coming year. Sometimes you knowing the right thing to do isn't that easy to figure out. You know that this committee stands at the ready to assist anyone as we try to make some sense of the shape of our new moment. Thank you, everybody. I am optimistic. It will be better. <laughs> now, this should be indicative if you see this space this many times. Please get involved, people. <laughs> this organization functions for you and because of you. So whatever's in your school set that you think you can bring to the table, I can guarantee you there is a committee that's going to need you. So please step up. Just ask. We're here. So now, Government Relations Committee of GAN is tasked with advocating the legislation favorable to GAN's interests and to oppose any legislation that does not serve. The interest of our membership. Here again, hard working group of people I want to recognize Edward Black, Harvey Davidson, Emma Guest of Dallas, uh, Leonel Hanaka, William Johnson, Jeff Ryback, John Semlak, Andy Sider, Cedar, sorry, and Joe Spalak. We thank them for their commitment to serve the GAP membership. <coughs> Lobbying during the pandemic is really tough. Everything has been limited to emails for the most part. Uh, the committee, of course, has continued to meet using Zoom. Uh, the primary focus of the committee's work has been to first the New York City Council to move on initiative 289A to get it out of committee, to get it out for a vote. At this point, no mention of 289A is complete without a remembrance of Judy Richheimer, who dedicated years, uh, years of her life and her, her profession to get this legislation rolled. Members of the committee have continuously reached out to their representatives to push this bill. We have reached out to you to reach out to your representative to push this bill. And we're going to be hitting you up again in the coming weeks. We've been able to hold on to the 30 sponsors. And we also have the support of the public advocate, but we don't have a vote on the issue. But we're going to lose most of them 
when the new terms take place. And we're getting and you're getting turned out. So you will be seeing this again. You've got you want to get 289A done in this legislative term. We also know we have to be prepared to carry this into yet another term. So we're expanding government relations agenda in developing a library, a set of tools that will allow us to become more vocal and more efficient in our communications with legislative representatives. And again, we're going to be keeping you informed because we are a small association and we need as many voices as possible. We need your voices. Another project that we'll be working on in the coming year will be the building of partnerships. Uh, an ad hoc committee that was spun out of or within NYC company, just like it's been before, and we'll be trying to connect with them in the coming year. As many of the agencies and alliances can conform with other tourist based operations, industry, professions, and associations can only serve to amplify our voice. We will continue to uh, participate in Destination Capital Hill. Now, this was getting into the national spotlight. We lobby with uh, tourism trade associations from all over the country in Washington. Uh, 2020 was canceled, 2021 was virtual. Really fascinating to talk to your elected representatives and find they haven't a clue as to what tourism means to their local communities, to their local school boards. Where the heck do they think the money is coming from? And of course, how the rest of the world views the United States and the city of New York as an attractive and viable destination. We are going to be there again this time of year. That's enough for me for now. But I do want to thank our membership for their participation. Oh, one more thing. Also, we've been participating uh, in the protests, bring back live guides, and you've seen them posted on social media. That's it. We're extending the guide as best we can on this. Uh, we can advocate for positions favorable for our industry. So we've made our public relations and communications available. Uh, to Robert Hoffman, who is organizing these protests, we've been to already, two more plans. One, we hope to have at City Hall. If you haven't shown up in the other thing, that one is good. We will keep you informed, but continue to move forward. And the Government Relations Committee is very proud to serve this community. Thank you very much. Uh, for the next committee to meet, sorry, IT committee, and uh, just going to go to the Okay, so the IT committee basically we provide the technical support and the website support uh, for Gannon. Uh, we have had a quiet year, just making sure that Zoom is working properly and that the website is updated as um, needed. We are I'm exploring actually um, perhaps updating uh, Gannett's emails uh, that we use for our committee emails and have something more robust and less spam and less, getting less bouncing. So that would be a project um, for the upcoming year. Our committee members, uh, myself, um, Mark Lennon, who's the Americans Chair and a wonderful uh, support, of course, um, Lyle Croft, Phil Clear, um, Sam Hall, Mark Mises, and AJ Stevens. Uh, I just want to go over some of the analytics. If you uh, have Google Analytics, so you can see how our website is doing and what um, kind of contacts we've been making with us. Um, for the month of August, um, there were 7,100 visits to the website, okay, um, um, 5,300 users. Uh, most people go to a single page, but people are actually, a lot of people are on the um, the find a guide page, and we have consistently had one to 250 returning users who are GAD members um, primarily. Um, we are reaching primarily the USA, 95% of USA, but also a UK, Canada, Australia, as well as China. 88% um, of the interest in the page, as I said, goes to the find a guide page. So make sure your profiles are updated. People are looking on that page. And um, so, you know, there's something, don't you know, get the website, your page on the website. You can um, make sure your, your picture is, is updated, but also make sure your report descriptions are updated. Now, you'll see um, the, your uh, member profile 
the section that is on your specialty course, that is all keyword searchable. So if you put a, a you know a special type before you do it, people are looking for that type before, they will find it. I would use um, Susan's knitting for as an example. Knitting is one of the words. So someone look for knitting for she will pop up. So you make sure that um the paper that you're talking about is updated. Of course, if you have any issues with that, contact me or contact um, Mark. Um, we continue to work with the public relations committee to um, provide support for promoting our events and news, um, updating the menu on our page with information on COVID-19, our health and safety guidelines, and new banners for the after awards for guide week and the 9 commemoration event. And all notices and documents are posted almost immediately on the website for members to consult. We also help with the backend management of Wild Acre Park and the main website um, with all our business. And I'm not even not really a member of the ship management um, system. Our long term, -term goals include working with industry relations, and I will also speak of that. Um, uh, we have the page is pretty much ready to go as soon as um, the state of work as soon as industry relations says the word. And so we'll have a new way of providing our industry partners. With a new page, with a new kind of, of support to, um, to reach out to our members and also to reach out to the general public. So, thanks always to my community, especially to Mark, who really does all of the busy front work that I don't have time to do. He helps set up your profile, he deletes all the spam, all the, the, the nasty accounts that I get in. Um, he catches everything if it should um, slip through the cracks. Um, and I'm also grateful for the assistance of the entire committee of Wyatt's, uh, Bill, Stan, Mark, and AJ. Um, you guys are always pitching in. Um, really, I think a very few meetings that we're going to do, everybody um, is willing to help out. And so, so thank you to my committee. And um, any questions? Any questions for IT or IT? Where am I? IT? Yes. No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys. So thanks again to my committee. So, um, our next is um, industry relations. All right, good evening, everybody. I will echo what everybody else has said. It's so lovely to see a lot of you, uh, all of you tonight. And it's been great to see some of you out in the field working as well. And I'm sure that's going to continue to grow, especially once we get into the spring of 2022. It's kind of appropriate that we're doing this tonight, the day after the Jewish New Year. It feels like a brand new beginning. And uh, you all know, as New Yorkers, we're all a little bit Jewish. So that's okay. Well, Sean, so much, everybody. It's so good to have you help me and speak New Year. Um, so the industry relations have been yet another pretty busy year this year uh, in 2020 and 2021. And we look forward uh, to continuing to be the face of the travel trade, uh, to the travel trade uh, for Yank uh, moving forward. Uh, I do want to thank everybody who contributed to the community this year. So bear with me as I go through the schedule on this. Uh, Bob Yelker, our co chair, Harvey Davidson, our chair emeritus. Uh, Mitch Bach, Nikki Padilla, Deborah Blyle, Fred Flanker, Maggie Brown, Jerry Jasper, Megan Gilbert, Anne Kermit, Stuart Ginsburg, Scott Willage, Nuri Gordon, Maggie Brown, I think I said her twice, that's how much work she did, uh, Eileen Hort, Claude Tobak, Megan Murad, and Patrick Van Rosenbaum. Uh, if I left somebody out, I severely apologize, but uh, thank you guys all for everything you did uh, this past year. Uh, for the first time in our committee's history, at least because I know we've started having regular meetings, uh, Zoom has certainly helped to facilitate that. And we're certainly going to continue moving forward with that. And anybody who would like to join our committee, certainly just shoot me an email at industry relations at founding.org. Uh, without a doubt, the biggest accomplishment and the biggest focus of our committee this year was Guide Week 2021, or a great conference, online conference that's out there that took place in the middle of May. Uh, its success continues to position Yannick as a leader in the tour guide industry, not just in New York City and not just in the United States, but around the world. And a huge thank you to everybody who helped uh, get the event up and running and those who helped volunteer their time during uh, the event as well. In addition to all of you, my name, all the wonderful members of our board who were so supportive as we got this initiative off the ground. Uh, I also want to give just an extra special thank you to both Mitch Bob and the uh, Without whom the event would not have come off, and 
they are both very eager to be working on the uh, 2022 version of that. So stay tuned. Um, just so you know, we attracted 407 registered tour guides to our event uh, from more than a dozen countries around the world. The numbers broke down at 70 GAC members, 151 from other associations around the United States, and 186. Oh, sorry, 151 association registrations from anywhere in the world that they were associated with the tour guide association, and 186 general registrations for tour guides were not associated with local uh, associations. Uh, we had 12 great educational sessions. We had an amazing uh, keynote speaker, Adina Turquoise Robinson, and uh, the videos are still available if you can register. Uh, you can go to um, guideweek.org and find them that way or travel. Campfire.com, you can find them that way uh, as well. Um, we are planning to move forward with this event. We did not set out to make this a money making event for Gannett, but it did. It made a lot of money. We, we netted almost $10,000 for this event. So we are going to do our sponsor. We have four major sponsors, so I just want to shout them out one more time. Travel Curious. Indie Travel, Peak, and a tour of her own, which is based in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the fact that it was revenue positive is a true win for the organization. As you heard, uh, we did do some membership uh, during the pandemic uh, for obvious reasons. Some people left the industry, others felt they couldn't afford to pay the membership fee, which is understandable and uh, certainly a possibility that we might see a tip membership again. So uh, the timing couldn't have been better, although I would like to say that was the grand plan. It certainly wasn't. We're happy to pay money for that wasn't for uh, our ultimate plan. Uh, moving forward, uh, we are planning to make this an annual event. We're probably going to shift it to sometime in late February, early March. We're going to start those discussions in the next week or two uh, with the idea that if we did it in May this year, you're all going to be working. So no one's going to be able to come to a conference uh, at that time. And the conference might look a little different too. It might be somewhat virtual and a, more of a hybrid at some in person, some virtual. A uh, couple other uh, things we worked on this year, uh, the Touring Road City Campaign. Now, uh, we launched this last year right before the AGM and uh, started promoting it throughout the fall. It didn't quite get the traction that we had uh, really hoped, but we feel it was a worthwhile, worthwhile attempt in the darkest days of COVID to at least some attention to the fact that taking walking tours uh, was perhaps the safest form of recreation you could have uh, during the pandemic being outside. Uh, we still own the domain name, and the tools that were uploaded there are still live on the site. Uh, and we'll continue to evaluate and working together with the IT committee and others to see what the next steps will be. At its peak, there were 110 tours listed on the site. Uh, and thank you to everybody who uploaded their tours. And two more thank yous. Thank you to Megan and Rod, who have been together our intro video. And thanks to Deborah Bob, who did all the graphic work for, uh, for the online event. So thank you guys so much for that. Uh, one of our biggest tasks every year is maintaining and forming new industry connections uh, to the travel trade and continuing to do that as best we can. Our relationship with NYC company is as strong, I think, as it's ever been. Uh, again, Harvey Davidson, congratulations on being reelected to another three year term as a board member ex officio at NYC and company, which basically means he gets to work board meetings, can't vote, but he's always there advocating for tour guides uh, and for gang guides. Thank you so much, Harvey, for that and everything you do. And let me be the first to say congratulations on being the 2022 D. Gelder uh, Award winner. And I'm honored that I will be able to present you in that uh, regard. Uh, we're thrilled to have Fred Dixon, the CEO of the NYC Company, be our uh, speaker at our last meeting in August under much more positive circumstances than when he addressed us in June of 2020. Uh, and if you didn't see his presentation, check it out on uh, our YouTube channel, the Gannett Institute Channel. Uh, I think it'll give you guys a sense of where the industry, uh, the travel industry in general in New York is going, and you can use that to plan your own tours and uh, move forward. Uh, speaking of NYC and Company, they did form an allied organization group uh, for their coalition for hospitality and tourism recovery, and I was honored to serve on that committee on behalf of GANIC, and uh, we'll continue to stay in touch with GANIC, uh, with NYC and Company uh, that way. Uh, we continue to represent Gannick at various industry events. Harvey and I uh, attended the NISIA online conference in the fall last year, and Harvey also attended again this past April. And this isn't even in my report, but just last week, 
uh, Harvey, Bob, and Eileen Ward representing NAG at an event put on by Gotham Media and One World Observatory, kind of celebrating the turn of, of New York City tourism. And we made some great connections there that we will work to foster with either industry partners or venues for meeting spaces or things like that. Uh, speaking of industry partners, uh, we currently have 19 active industry partners, which is a decrease from the 25 that we had this year, uh, at this time last year. Um, some of those companies went out of business, others just chose not to renew. And uh, we did attract seven new partners during this fiscal year. So that shows that there is interest in partnering with Gannon, but the next step is to make it more worthwhile to make sure that they don't come in for a year and bail out after a year. So that is why this long awaited industry partner reboot is going to be happening. Uh, we're hoping to launch it by the October membership meeting. If not, I promise you, it will be launched by November. Membership meeting in this way, we can all get used to it and really be able to use it once uh, things really start to pick up in the spring. Uh, it'll be a more robust program. It encourages more interaction between our members and the industry partners uh, who uh, decide to sign up uh, with that. Uh, meeting venues. Uh, we are excited to have in person meetings once again. And I do want to say thank you again to, your brother, uh, to Bob Gelber, who has co chaired the committee, has taken on the task of uh, leading the search for uh, membership meeting venues. I can tell you, in November we will be in Staten Island, and December we will be at the United Palace up in Washington Heights. We are still scouting around for October venue. Things are a little tough right now to find venues uh, in our budget range, but we are working diligently to do that. So stay tuned. We should have an announcement about that in the next week or two. Um, but if anybody does have suggestions on places for us to hold in person meetings, please let us know. And of course, I'll make my plea as I always do don't just say, hey, let's meet at Yankee Stadium. Please give us a name, give us a contact so that we can reach out to them and start getting the ball rolling. But again, Bob, thank you so much for picking up the ball and running this as well. Uh, so, just real quick, our roles for the coming year launching the renewed industry partner program, uh, planning and conducting guidance 2022, representing ADIC at local, national, and international tourism functions. And we're discussing ways to attend uh, industry trade shows where we can also bring your one page. You have one page as a tour guide here in New York uh, and represent them at industry trade shows around the country uh, to help build some more business. Uh, we'll continue to form and strengthen strategic alliances with industry associations on best practices and how to get GATIC uh, more dive more exposure and uh, working to get us on more boards of tourism associations. That's already uh, used to be great in that. Uh, and then uh, one term goal, I want to eventually create an advisory board of industry partners who can kind of give us guidance on the tourism industry from outside the tourism perspective. But I'd like to get our program up and built up a little bit before we both really go into that. So uh, with that, I think I've probably taken up enough of your time. So thank you very much. Thank you to all members of the committee. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain. So a little hard for me to see. So is that Cindy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for coming and sharing your knowledge and the new partners are they restaurants? What industries coming in? The new partner, you said seven new. Uh, I have to double check that. I, I okay, just out at some yep. point. Okay, the other thing is now that they're less members for capacity, I think it used to be we upped it for 100 people for the venues. Is it still that high now that it's the membership is lower? What's the spec if people want to look at venues and suggest? Uh, great question. So the question is, what is the number of the capacity going to be for in-person membership meetings? Uh, we have been working basically on a, a model where in Manhattan or perhaps downtown Brooklyn, venues need to have a minimum capacity of 100 people. If it's uh, somewhere else, uh, elsewhere in Brooklyn or Queens or Brooklyn uh, or Bronx or Staten Island, uh, I think we did that down to 60 or 70 people. Uh, I would say we haven't really discussed that, Cindy, but I would say considering COVID and the need to still try to have some social distancing just to make people comfortable, uh, I think we'd be comfortable keeping those numbers the same at this point. But if you do have a venue that is eight people and you think it's perfect and they want to host us, let us know. We'll try to figure it out. I only and, do Manhattan. But okay. okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> but even in Manhattan, if you know a venue that is anxious to host us uh, and has a capacity of less than 100, let us know if we can make it work. We absolutely can try to do that. Bob, is that sound? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, cool. Any other thoughts or questions? Oh, Asian side, the lights really bright. I know, and also, it's the hot. What? The camera, I know. Um, the October, I'm going to look at the staff at the West location again? Uh, the St. George Ship. Oh, yes, finally. Which we were supposed to be at in April of 2020. Well, uh, and thanks to our Staten Island Chair Emeritus Paul Tilback, we're going to go back to uh, the St. George Ship. We're looking forward. Sorry, I can't see it. So just stand up and ask your question. Uh, for those who want to go to Staten Island, I just want to say that since two or three weeks, we now have a fast ferry uh, going to uh, the Northern Empire. Yeah. So that's like less than a maybe six, seven minute walk to the St. To the George Theater. Yeah. So from where the New Jersey ferries leave, you know, right, right, you know, a few minutes from here. It takes 17 minutes. Right. And the ferry also makes a stop around 30 seconds. Okay. So if you didn't hear that, just in case you're wondering, uh, NYC Ferry just launched new service going from different points in Manhattan to Staten Island, in addition to the Staten Island Ferry. So that's another way to think about it. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. So next, um, interested in the Gary Chen will be recording. All right. So as of today, September 9, 2021, Janet Dustin. Active membership is 328. That includes 235 full members and 93 provisional members. This represents about 11% of all licensed guides in New York City. That's out of about 2,900 or so. And our members primarily reside in New York City. We have about three quarters of our membership uh, in the five boroughs, with about 10% of our membership in the great state of New Jersey. And about 7% that are in New York State, outside of New York City, and about 5% elsewhere. So that includes the DC area, Maryland and Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Florida, Texas, the state of Washington, and also the Netherlands. We do have new potential members that continue to apply every month, and the majority of them do opt to become new provisional members. We also have past lapse members who do continue to renew and reapply uh, for membership. And that's all because of the reputation, all the activities that we've been doing, the visibility, the resources, the different events that we do offer. And we do continue to offer virtual interviewing for all of our new applicants, and that's certainly reduced uh, the barriers to the application process. Uh, you might remember that all used to be in person, and that's really allowed for both local and non local. Uh, residents to become members and for anybody that's watching if you do want to become a member it's very easy everything starts online at danic.org slash membership a top driver of membership does continue to be personal referrals so keep on making those referrals since last year's agent we did have 30 new members who joined us in addition we also had 12 provisional members who have met requirements and have become full members and as a reminder, in order to become a full member, you do need to be a provisional member for a minimum of one year. You also do need reported attendance at four monthly membership meetings, including this meeting, this account, and letters of recommendation from two current full members. Overall, Janet, we did see a drop in membership compared to last year. At last year's AGM back on September 9th, we did have 379 active members, 266 full members. And 113 provisional members, which of course uh, does reflect the continued state of the industry. Um, while tourism activity certainly has increased from last year, but not quite yet at uh, what things were looking like pre pandemic. And by the numbers, the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, which used to be called uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, DCA, uh, only granted 55 new guide licenses uh, since last year's PGM. And looking at the period before that, there were 295 new licenses that were granted 
and before that, 456. So there's been a dramatic drop in the number of people who are becoming uh, in the valley of Spring Break City. I do want to recognize our membership community members Deborah Blount, Tony DeSante, Adam Zuka, Charlie Messner, Mel Wasserman, Jeremy Wilcox. And I do also want to thank all past, current, and future community members like perhaps Joe Khan, who was helping out with uh, assisting members with checking in today. Pre pandemic, the most visible community efforts uh, was checking in attendance at monthly membership meetings. We'll continue to focus on uh, new member recruitment and retention, providing more value and benefit to members, including making those benefits easier to access. Our past events have included uh, monthly member applicant meetings online in the room. We also had uh, recently our first in person social event over a year that was our networking happy hour at Zalia back in June. That was hosted by the owner of the restaurant, who's also a cat guy, Libby Corridon Chalk. We also had a virtual half year at the end of last year. We also did a virtual new member orientation, which is available to you online. So if you haven't gone through the orientation and want to check it out, it's available to be on our website for members on our member benefits page. And that member benefits page is updated regularly. So if you haven't been there recently or uh, at all, it's a great collection of resources on a simple page. You have to log on your website benefits. We also continue to coordinate the Janikai Green Dad Awards, like Wine Barrett. So if uh, you don't have one, you want to order one, very easy to do. It all happens uh, on that page, Janikai.org benefits. And we are continuing to plan in person events like an upcoming networking happy hour in person. Um, we'll announce that when we have a available. And some form of a post quality party at the beginning of next year. The um, more details will come forward as uh, those arrangements are being made. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now, or you can also uh, reach out to me in the committee at membership at Yes, a question. Yeah, not so much a question. Uh, I'm the, the subcommittee for the happy hours and for the party, uh, the post holiday party. Okay. So if anybody has any suggestions about what might be a nice place for this uh, networking happy hour, I also want to look into industry relations and see if any of those people are restaurants that might be, you know, uh, might want to help us out here and, uh, and do that kind of thing. And if there's anybody that wants to join the subcommittee, you know, probably involved going to some bar someplace and talking to somebody and say, you know, if you want to bring us the us tour guides in and, have them buy you a free drink because you're representing the tour guys. Who knows? But anyway, so that's where we're at with all of that. Okay. If you have any any good suggestions? Uh, I'm also thinking about that that post holiday party uh, in particular. You know, some place maybe that uh, allows a little bit of dancing, not like the last time, and uh, you know, DJ a little more action. The last one was nice, but. My, my name is by the way, it's Tony Musante. Uh, you can contact me, I guess, by another membership at Canada. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody who's watching later or on the, uh, the uh, virtual cast, uh, Tony Musante was just mentioning that we uh, are considering additional venues for future uh, happy hours as well as for consult uh, party. Um, I don't remember how long, but I know that what was called the DCA Department of Consumer Affairs was closed for good part of this time. Do you think that's a reason they weren't as many licensed? They were the people no, they, had the, the 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 has been open uh, to new licenses. It's been open to take. Uh, I don't know exactly how the, uh, the new testing works, but there are new uh, people who have become guys. I think it's a reflection of uh, just the state of the nation, the lack of jobs, and that's all the case. Yeah. 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 If you're walking at the FDCA or the uh, if you still need to renew your license, uh, you can make an appointment. 
Uh, I don't think they're accepting just walk ins, but you have to make an appointment. You can also do it online very easily. I know a number of people have done it pretty quickly. You can also mail it. Yeah. Not a question, but I'm just I'm bringing this microphone here. If people have questions, so it's easier for people to hear them. Uh, you can just come back to where I am. Everyone can hear the microphone. So, oh, yeah. I think it'll be easier for everyone has questions. During these, the rest of the reports and during my report later, I'll just come up with this mic and allow everyone to hear your vote back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our um, next presenter will be John Sandler for the multi legal Where is that report? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's not a long one, so I won't take one long feet. Uh, COVID has not been good for the multilingual guide sector. Uh, and of course, we've all had suffered a terrible time, but the people who rely on tourists from outside of the United States, obviously things have been worse. Uh, as tourism recovers, we do uh, incur, plan to do more to encourage guides to join GAN. Uh, Multilingual guides to enjoy GAN. One way is we uh, plan to do is to have more of our promotional material uh, that we send out to you know, refer to the non GAN and start translated into some of the more popular languages that are offered. Um, we haven't had any meetings this year. Um, but we have uh, organized in cooperation with education a couple of uh, online PUPs, uh, one on Costa Rica and the Bird Paradise, uh, which I know Fred Planser helped coordinate that, and also one that um, I had a small hand in organizing uh, in cooperation with some guys from Ukraine, the one on Yaroslav and Elias and Nicholas Tibet, which is very interesting for people to know. As I said, I do hope to be organizing a future meeting, either on Zoom or in person, uh, to rev up the committee again. And so, I, uh, if anybody is interested in, you know, working with issues related to multilingual guides in Ghana, please you feel free to contact me at multilingualguides at and hopefully we will. Uh, and I do want to thank. One person, my co chair, Gary Warren, who has uh, persevered a little bit with me on, on through this, and uh, I look forward to a better year. Thank you. Thank you. Please, aside, I would like to make speak up for the people who are not uh, who are attending online at this meeting. Uh, over 30 people are joining us online, in addition to over 50 people who have checked in. This to be in person. Uh, I do know the sound isn't as good as we hoped, but we hope we will do that better in the future. But I want to thank you for bearing with us. I know a lot of you are sticking with us, even though uh, the sound is a little bit of a struggle. So uh, thanks to everybody for attending this meeting, both virtually and online, or, or at, in person. And it's so great to see you. Thank you, John. Yes, and welcome to everyone who is who is um, following online. John has uh, his his um, computer open for Zoom, but the one right now and is uh, is all um, the comments and questions. So next we have our newsletter committee, and uh, David Gardner will be reporting. I've been waiting for this. Everybody, yes, good evening, everybody. Great to see you. Thank you, Madam President. All right, I'm now representing our newsletter committee. And uh, this is not new, but this is the most uh, current recent issue. I have a few copies if anybody wants to hit me up Our staff has two committee members. They're listed in the mass as follows editor in chief, myself, Dave Gardner. 
that should be entered in the picture. We get contribution from those we refer to as staff reporters. Those submissions like tour reviews, book reviews, and event coverage, tourism issues, and so on. As well as a presidential column and our newly revamped personal column. For, for participation, we have attended every monthly Janet meeting in that way. We're going to continue our quarterly site for production, presenting a new newsletter for the members of this organization. The template is a 12 or 16 page tune. We've determined that anything more would be unfeasible, impractical, and unreadable. At the mailing ceremony, we feel the hard copies have arrived at their destinations about a week. We publish a website version, often with additional stories and pictures. There's no compensation for our considerable time and effort, but we do generate expenses like printing and mailing and pass them along to the booth trader. We've been on time, under budget, and expect no increases in the coming year. But uh, just thanks to uh, Treasurer in general, Gallery, and to Mark Landman for uh, posting the website first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a question, uh, question from the President. For those of you who would like to know about our next deadline, that will be the end of this month, September 30th. If you look at the little uh, Dates that I do that I was tying a little bit of pop culture this time. It's the day that Frank Drescher on the upper from the Queen is 64. Thank you. I'm going to be he bounds on the screen and I'll have to put the line down maybe it's much, much more satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, new group to figure out what the will be in the population is Jerry Will. All right, you guys are going to be real sick of me over the next hour. Uh, but uh, that's just going to be for PR only for itself. Anyway, I want to first uh, thank some of the people who have helped the public relations committee over the last year since the AGM, um, including some of our great members, uh, for Michael Morgenthau, Sam Connor, Nathan McGraw, John Sennon, and Deborah Lau, for some of their work on uh, helping with the public relations for Yang. So, the public relations committee basically is the most front facing of all the Yang committees. Uh, we exist to advance the stature and public face of the organization. To not only raise the profile again, but just the whole concept of professional New York City tourist guides, the roles as ambassadors and educators for visitors to the city. We make the public and the media aware of what the organization is doing, as well as post material to entice the members to join us. In that regard, we assist a lot of other committees in their efforts. Um, some of our regular efforts include operating the Gannett social media accounts, primarily. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, operating a YouTube channel for the organization, running the blog on the website, publishing press releases for major initiatives the organization does, speaking to the media about tourism issues, and publishing the uh, regular online e newsletter. In addition to just the regular promotion that we do, we also reach out to the media to try and obtain coverage for that. Since the last AGM, we have scored media coverage for our work on the Catholic Initiative and following hours. The Red Book Star Review, News 12, Led the Bower, and most recently, Destination New York on Pix 11. Um, so the committee is always helpful and always happy to welcome any proactive members who are willing to execute new ideas about the organization and the profession to be better represented. Uh, emphasis on the word execute. I'm always happy for ideas, um, much happier for people who are willing to execute those ideas themselves uh, as myself and other members of the committee, you know, do so much already. Um, and we will continue to try and raise the professional profile of our organization and our industry over the year. You know, so many industries they talked about in regards to COVID and long recoveries, and we're going to make sure that our industry is always being talked about as much as possible. And so the great work we do will be in regards to the future of the year. 
So thank you on behalf of the PR committee, and I'll be happy to take any questions about that. Sam, yes. I have an idea. Would anybody want to be interviewed as you talk about your favorite thing in New York in your favorite spot? If so, I'd like to do it. All right, so if anyone's interested, uh, come see Sam at the conclusion of the class. Any other questions? That is it for the um, organization today. And we will segue into the budget and all the way for All right, so we're going to uh, go over the uh, budget, so we'll be discussing uh, in three regards. So, so first, can everyone see what's on the screen? Yep. All right. Uh, so as of last night, here is what Janet has in the, uh, the bank. So in our Santander checking account, we have $20,804.25. In our savings account, we have $12,951.75. So that is currently the current state of finance finances. Now, as I'm going through the various committees, I'll be presenting Basically, one, what was the budget that was approved at the AGM last year? What was actually spent to date? Um, and I will clarify for, uh, for those who are relatively new to the organization. Danik's fiscal year operates from November 1st through October 31st. So we still have almost two months left in our current fiscal year. So the actual numbers are to date. In some of these cases, more money may be spent before the end of our fiscal year. Um, and then the final problem will be what has been proposed by these various committees for the forthcoming fiscal year, which then will begin on November 1st. So going down to the order, first up here, we have the awards committee. So given the virtual nature of it, uh, some of these things may have been pared down, uh, but what was budgeted for program ads, because when we decided to virtual, we weren't sure if we were going to do that, was zero. We did bring in about six hundred twenty-five dollars in revenue for that. Uh, proposed for next year is two thousand. Uh, you know, Matt will explain more. We're hoping to charge higher premium for ads and spend more money. Uh, we were hoping to get about two thousand dollars in sponsors for the board. Unfortunately, we were not able to secure any, but we're going to keep the same goal of taking that uh, amount next year. Um, we were anticipating getting $1,000 in ticket sales from the virtual ceremony. We came close to about 855. We will again hope for $1,000 revenue. Um, and so you can see the total sales we're hoping for 3,000 in revenue from the awards community. We brought in just shy of 1,500. Um, but we are going to set our expectation high and hope for the best. And we are hoping to bring $5,000 from that committee. Um, we'll just add a point of note that if anyone has any questions about specific things, I'll be happy to run back to certain slides at the conclusion of the presentation. So let's go to expenditures for this. Now, I left up a number of categories here just so you know what they are, including many that became a moot point in regards to the virtual show. So, no after party, we didn't have to move around the equipment. Uh, we budgeted $1,600 for the host. Our host for the last one, Bill Ritter, was gracious enough to do it for free. So that was a, as a treasure, I appreciated that. Uh, we will budget $1,400 potentially for our next virtual post. Uh, every committee has a miscellaneous budget for things that don't fall into an otherwise approved line category. They anticipated spending a thousand. Appreciated that they only spent to 23760. So they're going to budget about 250 for that. 250 is generally what we consider the kind of standard for the miscellaneous for each committee. Uh, we didn't do music, we didn't have a photographer, no posters, pre event reception, uh, no programs, room and hall fees. We didn't just pay to spend any, 
Uh, that basically they ended up being able to send it to the white schools, so that's just over a thousand dollars, and just they send a thousand dollars for whatever virtual platform is used again. Uh, we did hire a stage manager for less than the budget, as you can see there. Uh, this is someone who helped us kind of manage the flow of the online show. Uh, trophies is still a very big budget item, like if you've ever seen the trophies in person, they're actually quite lovely. We just paid it spending 2300 We actually spent 2563 84 so we're going to knock our budget up to 2600 more in line with what the trophies are currently costing us. Um, and we anticipated the job for help, we did not need that. So we anticipated spending 4500 on the awards, we did spend less, we spent it's just shy of 4000 uh, We're anticipating spending up to $5,000 to make this next virtual ceremony a success. So that is the awards committee in a nutshell. Uh, next, we're moving on to revenues and expenditures through the certification committee. Um, so, just want to come up here and see there was an anticipated revenue of 6000 uh, The actual revenue was 2100 and then based on $300 per participant in the program. Uh, they have budgeted, again, anticipated revenue of 6000 and that is based on the hope of running two courses during the fiscal year. Uh, hopefully, hoping that each course would have 10 enrollees and at the same price of $300 per enrollee. Um, you can see the budget for books was $500. They only spent 318 and anticipated to spend $500. The bus rental for the practical of the ceremony, they were anticipated to spend up to $1,500. They spent $829. Um, that fun looking little trolley, I'm sorry, I didn't get to ride that thing on, uh, on my time to the course. Uh, so they are just going to spend about seventeen hundred dollars. Um, and again, when you see these paid revenues to certification committee, keep in mind this is still the anticipation of running two courses. Um, Honorarians, they're anticipating to spend eighteen hundred. They did not spend any there, but they're going to keep the same anticipation. Miscellaneous, they budgeted five hundred. They only spent sixty-two to ten. I always appreciate that approval. Uh, so we knock that down to two fifty. Printing they just paid at 500. They didn't spend enough printing this term, so we knocked that down to 250 as well. Room rental slash online services. So that's basically they need to rent a room at a WeWork facility over the cost of the various online services. They anticipated spending 1800 We spent less than 500 We are budgeting at 2042 courses. So they expected this fiscal year to spend $6,600. As you can see to date, um, that will probably be the end of this fiscal year. They spent less than 2000 we are giving this committee a budget of 6500 to go on to two courses next year. All right, we're going to move on to the education committee. So they, for revenues, the main three things the education committee does that brings in money are fan tours. In case you need to run a little more complicated fan tours, which we do chart. Some of you may have read on a recent Newark uh, trip uh, and here again to Mark and Andy. We're organizing that and that it uh, costs them a nominal charge. So that's an example of that. Uh, the committee anticipated bringing in $1,125. Just from the one that we ran, which is the newer one, we brought in $210. Um, and Nina anticipates that the committee will bring in $2450 to uh, clarify where that uh, number is coming from here. Um, just reading my notes, Nina. That's based on the idea of running. Um, a couple of those tours next year, charging that would be more complicated, charging $35 per person times the anticipated 35 members per person. So that would be 1225 per fan tour, and running about two of those in the next fiscal year for that um, anticipated item. Um, PEPs, uh, we typically do um, bring in money when we have in person PEPs. None of those did happen this fiscal year, so that's called zero. And then intends to return to that and just get a revenue of $1,000. Um, and that would be for you know, the idea of doing some big person PP that we did previously. Um, and then just potential miscellaneous revenue, which is all zero because we don't just take that uh, as the case. So the committee expected to bring in, like Joe, over $1,000. They only brought in $210. Uh, and I have very ambitious plans for the next year, um, hoping that the committee will bring in $3,450. Now going to expenditures, some of the band tours do cost money to run if you have to rent a bus 
um, where there is one coming up that will be going up to Beacon, which will allow a component going up to Bam and Island. We have to uh, write the vote for that. So Nina anticipated that the committee would spend 225. Um, we did get, uh, we did spend more between the, the upcoming uh, Beacon tour and the newer one, 1,276. So we're going to give the committee an anticipated expense of 1,200 for transport expenses. Now, specifically for bus rentals, they anticipated spending 1,000. Uh, so far, only 700 have been spent. Uh, but Nina is asking for 2,400 for that. The idea would be that we would run two trips in the next fiscal year that would involve buses and spending about $1,200 each for transportation for those tours. Um, honoration, honorarians and donations, uh, for instance, with the Newark tour, um, Mark did arrange to give honorariums to a number of the great presenters and educators who assisted that trip. That's an example of where that would come in. Uh, this is in the year we budgeted $1,100. Uh, and that is basically about what the committee spent. Uh, so we're going to give them a little bit more. Uh, and it's requesting 1,350 for honorariums and donations for the next year. And while this committee has never had miscellaneous budget before, we are a by default given every committee. Uh, possible two hundred fifty dollars for that. Now expenditures for PDPs, we expected to spend twelve hundred on PDPs. We do not actually have to send in one on the PDPs that did operate virtually in the fiscal year. Uh, we anticipate that we will have to spend about eight hundred, and that number is looking over the, uh, the notes here. Again, it's just doing a uh, couple of in-person PDPs where we would have to pay for a person there and pay for a room. So that is the education. Moving on to specifically just revenue reverse for the industry relations committee. Um, renewals, they expected to bring in 1,170. They brought in 855. So with the revamp, the industry relations committee is anticipating bringing in $1,330 uh, yeah, $1, for renewals. Um, job, job fair became basically guide week. Uh, they anticipated that they would bring in $500 that would be put into the traditional job fair because it became diary. There's a Michael Miller to the current news report. As you can see, we brought in just shy of $10,000 uh, in revenue from diary, which was beyond what we expected. We're not sure we'll make as much uh, around two, but always hope to exceed our expectation. So, Michael is anticipating a revenue of 7800 for the next diary. Um, bringing in new industry partners, they expected to bring in 1900 revenue. Uh, they only brought in 475, but again, they did not obviously hope to bring in $1,900 from bringing in new partners for the next fiscal year. Uh, Michael mentioned during his report this is a new line item for the committee uh, fees for distributing members one pagers at industry events. So, this would be basically you would pay the annual money to distribute those one pagers. Uh, we intend or hope to bring in $2,250. Revenue from that. Um, now, when we launched Tour Your Own City, we had the idea of charging money to non getting members uh, to be a part of that program. We anticipated that you could bring in 355. Uh, as that evolved, we decided that Tour Your Own City would only be open to getting members, so that one item is eliminated. So the Industry Relations Committee anticipated bringing in $4,465. Because Guy Week actually brought in $11,297.25. Uh, and they're anticipated revenue for the next year is $13,284. So we'll move on to the same committee, the expenditure. And for conferences and related travel, this is where folks like Harvey, Bob, and Michael and others go to uh, various conferences um, and others who we subsidize. We anticipated spending $3,000. Uh, we only spent $278.48. But we hope to be very busy in this fiscal year in terms of our conference and travel expenses. So we're interested in spending $4,000 for that. So, Guy Week on the job fair, we anticipated spending uh, $4,000 on that. Uh, great news is, in addition to very high revenues, uh, Guy Week did not cost us a lot of money to run. Uh, we spent $1,849.26 total. Um, but we do hope to spend a little bit more money on that. So, we budgeted for $4,000. Meeting room rentals, we anticipated spending five thousand um, because most of our meetings last year have been online. I tried to <laughs> that total that one thousand one hundred and fifty. Basically, it's just a percent 
be here tonight, which is a little bit more than our usual budget, but we spent so little we thought we would splurge on it all tonight. So thank you for coming. Um, and we do it, we are interested in raising that budget of uh, 6,000 mostly because uh, what we have found in our search is that you know what we had what to spend was not what people were looking to get in terms of menus, and we're going to be realistic try and spend a little more to get great spaces like this. Um, this is a budget they anticipated from the 500, they spend a little bit more, so it's to two, but they're keeping the same anticipation of 500. Professional organization dues are uh, anticipated spending 3250. Uh, they spend just $1,800,000, but they're going to keep the same anticipation of spending 3250. Uh, for your own city, and that's basically just the cost of keeping the website up and running. Uh, just paid spending 350, only 205 is spending, but we'll keep it at 350 just in case. Um, so these new categories which are deciding are basically stipends to potentially send members to the NFTA, NFTGA conference, and to potentially send members to the WFTA conference, which will be occurring uh, during this next fiscal year. So for NFTGA, we are looking to budget. $3,250 in stipends to send potential people there. More people will come on that uh, closer to the events. And the WFTJ are just paying $7,000 of stipends because that involves overseas travel. Obviously, the expenses are greater. And in terms of a new bunch of item here, we have industry partner promotion to better promote the whole program. And we are looking at pushing $500 for that. So the committee was looking to send $15,750. From last year, they only spent just a little over 5,000, uh, but they are really again, looking at this new launching program to spend about 28,850. We always hope to uh, come under, but that's the potential ceiling on uh, what this community will spend as it launches in the next fiscal year. So now we are going to move on to revenue for the membership committee, which is where, as a membership organization, the majority of our revenue comes from. So you should be charged under the holiday party. Uh, we obviously were not able to have a holiday party this past year. Uh, so those initial goals were zero. We are going to do uh, some form of a post-holiday gathering. Um, in January, it won't be on the scale of maybe where we were in Times Square the last time around, but it'll certainly be a greater scale and obviously uh, happy hour. So we are just getting bringing in the revenue from uh, that of $1,000, um, depending on the thing. And for membership renewals, we you know, expected in the, uh, the last year to lose a little bit of members. We thought, therefore, when we were coming at membership renewals, 36625 Our renewals actually exceeded our expectations by a little bit. You can see we brought in 37562 So we are anticipating a renewal of 33,125. Just to uh, go over the uh, math for that, um, we are anticipating again losing some members again. Um, we currently have, as Derek noted, just over 325 members of 1628. Um, we anticipate we will be probably somewhere around in the 240 to 275 range uh, after the next renewal season. We always hope that we'll be too pessimistic here. We were slightly too pessimistic last year, but we're just trying to uh, be realistic, and we're hoping that everybody will keep us along. Um, in terms of new members, uh, the committee expected to make about $3,000 in revenue from new members, and made to date uh, 2875 So this committee actually is pretty close to the mark in terms of expectation. Uh, we anticipate that we will get about 20 new members in the next fiscal year, which will bring us up to $2,500. Um, now, member badges, we do uh, we are charging money for these optional member badges. I'm wearing mine right now. Uh, we just figured we would bring in $260. We bought it about once a week, $110. Um, we just figured bringing in $300. So you see that the expenditures uh, really just pay to be a revenue neutral call. We only charge for the badges that it costs us to purchase them. So the membership committee anticipated bringing in $38,000. Uh, 85, and they brought in 40,660 to date. Um, we actually already have some new members going up for the next meeting, so that number actually goes up. Uh, for the coming fiscal year, the membership committee anticipates that it will bring in 36,925 members. There's a lot of deliberation uh, on the board to arrive at those numbers based on hopefully uh, kind of pessimistic uh, view of where things will shake out by the end of the year. Now, expenditures. Uh, so obviously, we spent no money. For a holiday party that's didn't exist. 
uh, we are going to budget three thousand dollars for a post holiday event. Again, something halfway in between the scale of recent happy hour and happy Australia, and some of like the bigger grand events we had at Times Square in the past. Um, membership committee does a number of mailing and new member packets and other things. So they have budgeted five hundred dollars for mailing expenses. They have managed to keep a little over one forty, but they're going to budget three hundred for that. Uh, and for the member badges. 260 so far. Uh, they budgeted for us spending 20660, and we're going to budget spending 300 on potential orders for cash. Miscellaneous and distributed 500, so we're knocking that down to 250. Networking happy hours, and it's just spending 900. The one we did so far is area cost 600. So we're going to anticipate doing about two of those for the fiscal year for a budget of 1200. New member orientations, we anticipated spending. 250, uh, nothing was spent on that. So we're going to increase the budget to 300 as we do intend to do in person in another orientation next fiscal year. Printing expenses budgeted 500, nothing was spent to pay. So we're going to knock that down to 300. For supplies, uh, they budgeted 500, only spent 33, 32. So we're going to knock that down to 250. Uh, we're adding a new column here for expenditures promotion and outreach, and we are going to budget $500. That'll be basically mailings of whatever we need to do to promote to the general New York City tour guide community about uh, becoming DAG members. So they anticipated spending $3,410. They spent a little over $1,000. Uh, they will anticipate if everything goes right, they'll spend about $6,400 just a year. Multilingual Guides Committee is the committees we love. Uh, the committee does not bring any money. And it's not spending. It's not spending. Uh, government relations, I just put, I keep revenue there just to point out that this is a community that's not bringing revenue, that's not the purpose of government relations. Um, the main thing that uh, this committee does is the destination capital hill event every year. Uh, they just paid us spending fifteen hundred dollars on that. Uh, they spent zero on the virtual one this year, uh, but it's very, very likely that the 2022 one will be in person in DC again. So we're going to budget $1,500 on that. Um, and then a $250 miscellaneous, which they did not spend a share, but we're going to keep the same thing. So what they budgeted was $1,750. We didn't spend it. But that's what we can do in the next newsletter. Uh, newsletter is great because it's all fixed costs, thank you, Dave and Linda. Um, and so it's very easy to budget for the actual hard copy printing. They anticipated spending $700. They have spent 561 to date. We're going to give them the same 100 again. Miscellaneous expenses 50. They didn't spend any of that, but they made it dollars still. Uh, postage, that's the cost of getting mail in these out. They anticipated 200 to date. They spent 142.58. We're going to give them 200 again. So they budgeted 950. They spent 7309. We're going to give them 950 again. And again, that's just very easy fixed cost. The art committee. So again, this is not bringing a revenue that's not the purpose. So the expenditures are doing online advertising and promotion. We anticipated spending two thousand. Uh, we did spend a little bit extra this year. Uh, primarily, we spent a, you know one of the things that made that go over budget was we spent thousand dollars on ads on Godness, which were not cheap uh, for a tour your own city. Not sure that worked out as well as the COVID, but it did bring a little extra funds to the site. We're going to keep that down to 2000 again for next year. Um, the miscellaneous uh, for the uh, industry, I'm sorry, the public relations, uh, which largely includes subscriptions to various news outlets uh, that the committee and the general board uses to be aware of what tours and articles are out there in the press. They anticipated spending 750 on these expenditures, it's a little over a thousand. So we're going to make the budget thousand dollars down the line of what we have been spending on that. Uh, online tools, which is mostly our mailchimp, the e newsletter, we anticipate spending 2000 We've only been spending, as you can see, a little over 700 on that, so we're going to bring that down online and spend to $1,200. So, for my committee, we anticipated spending a total of 4750 We spent a little over 4500 So, we're going to keep that out of line and anticipate spending of 4200 IT web committee, again, no revenue, uh, it's not what it does. So our domain registration and related expenses, and just say it's 250, that went a little up to 369. So we're going to make that realistic and bring that up to 310. Miscellaneous uh, 250, uh, did not spend any, so we're going to bring that into uh, 2130. Um, maintenance and posting for the website, and just say it's spending uh, 
2250. A little bit extra as you can see the spent that was 3,349. That additional was when we work our webmaster data and design a new industry partner page that will be used soon. Um, and we don't anticipate any major calls to the site in the next year, so we'll bring that down to 860. Um, and also because updates, general updates to the website are bringing into a new column where we are budgeting 1800. So where we would have to do something very significant completely recall into the partner page that will now fall under updates versus just basic website maintenance. Um, Zoom continues to obviously be a major expense for us. We just paid it from 1800 to date. We have spent 1619. Uh, as Zoom is probably likely to increase its fees, we are just paying 2500 for this year. So this committee anticipated spending 4550. Uh, due to attend to the number of extra things they have to do, they spent 5248. Now bringing that in line with the spent for about 5200. So now this is basically non committee revenue. Um, our initiation fee, we anticipated spending a thousand dollars on. Um, we brought in 250. Uh, it says 10 a year because uh, we are basically eliminating the initiation on the number of fee. Uh, it's ultimately not really what it needs, and we think it will make us a little bit more friendly in this difficult economy for our members. Uh, the late fee anticipated bringing in 300 because of the pandemic. We decided that we would not charge people who renew late the late fee, and we decided that we're going to make that permanent. Uh, we are no longer going to be charging late fees to people who renew late. Um, Jeremy, could I just? I think it might be worth clarifying that is the late fee for renewal, not the late fee for abandonment. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, late before renewal. So if normally it happened, you did not renew by the January number sheet, you charge the late fee. If you renew in March, you obviously still be charged the full 125 dollars Yes, uh, $125 dues, but do not charge you. Uh, we would like you to renew whenever you can. Um, now, no show fees. Uh, that is when basically you cancel the last minute or no show fan tour. We thought we and we charged $25 for that. Uh, it was a very long wait list and we opt out to $50. Uh, we were anticipated bringing in 500 and we brought in 375. Uh, we anticipated we'll bring in 500 for that. I would um, just gonna put on my scolding cap for a minute and say that that 375 we brought in is actually because of the current situation as the person who adjudicates that fee, I was very lenient. If it was somebody's first time no showing or they cancel, I didn't charge them the fee. I gave them basically, you know, one one freebie. Um, but please do not do this. You know, the reason we charge the, the no show fee is you know, we are all tours and professionals, and we hate it when people do not respect our time, and we just simply ask you to respect the time of the volunteers. Uh, if you sign up for a tour, we anticipate you will attend it. The only exception where I will always, always write off a no-show fee is in the case of a family, a documented family or medical emergency. Um, we are not full blood monsters in that regard. Uh, online payment fees, um, we didn't anticipate these in any, uh, any. We've got in 40 cents, I don't remember what that was for. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah. So um, that, that just made our call here. Um, so we anticipated this lineage revenue of 1800 We only got about 6540 uh, We are, um, again, just mostly for no-show fees, just for the money of 500 I always remind people our ideal revenue for no-show fees is $0.00. zero cents. Uh, Non-committee income, the interest we get in the bank, we thought we would get $25 of interest, we got nine sixty eight. We'll just pay $25 in interest. Uh, potential miscellaneous income that might come our way, 500, we get any, we're not going to add down to $200. So we will anticipate by 25, we got a 968 uh, interest, but we'll hold for 225. Now to our miscellaneous expenditures. Um, bank fees, uh, we just pay spend 250, and we'll spend 9110. Great, so we're not going to add down to 250. Uh, miscellaneous, um, just in, in other things that we might need to do. We anticipated spending 500. We spent, uh, I think, a little under 1800. That was just due to some expenses we incurred with the transition of the board and all of this. But those were, again, like the new industry partner page things that will not occur. So we're going to keep a $500 miscellaneous budget there. Office rent for the space we kind of do work, which is now at 115 Broadway, the old US uh, Real Trust building. We budgeted 
8,000 dollars uh, a year. To date, we have spent 68,155. Uh, Again, we will pay for anything again, so that we will be up to 8,000. So we're keeping that same budget. Um, we have our part time administrative assistant, we have usually spent 6,500 dollars on due to the nature of the way that it's operated. During the pandemic, um, we haven't had to use for that much. Unfortunately, for her, we only spent 5550 So we're bringing her budget down to 2500 dollars to use her when we might need assistance. Stationary and printing, we just pay 7500 to get more spent to 99 Or we're going to keep that budget 500 Various supplies we might need, uh, we just pay 7250 We spent nothing, but we'll keep that as 250 Our telephone voicemail service, which Bob is very kind to uh, to listen to on a regular basis. Uh, we budget one twenty five. We spent today one ten and seven. We're going to keep that at one twenty five. The cost of maintaining a long Africa system we budgeted thirty two hundred. Today we spent just about that. You can see, um, so we're going to keep that at thirty two hundred. So we anticipated a total miscellaneous expenditure of nineteen thousand three twenty five. Today we have spent less twelve thousand seven hundred fifty five point three. So we're going to bring that down to 15,225. Uh, corporate insurance is basically just insurance for your organization. Our directors officers liability insurance. We budget thousand dollars for we spent 76. We'll budget thousand just in case they raise that on us. Legal and professional fees, we budget 1500 We spent uh, $776.95. I'll uh, just to clarify what that is. That's basically the accounting fee process that the organization's tax for us. Um, we're keeping his budget at 1500 just in case he raises his fees in the next year. So, totals. Uh, we anticipated that we would have a total revenue in this fiscal year of 77515 to date. By the end of almost two months left to go, we have brought in $56,330.83. We are proposing revenues of $65,380. For expenditures, we thought we would bring in 106,875. We have only, I'm oh, sorry, spending, we thought we would spend 106,875. Fortunately for you, we've been very good in our, our spending this year. Uh, we only spent to date $39,712.90. Um, we are just a total potential expenditures of 82,075. Now, because this gets asked every year, I remember this being asked of Adrian as well, which is treasurer. I noticed that your anticipated expenditures, aka the money out, is greater than your anticipated money in. Again, these are anticipated expenditures. In no year that I'm aware of is going to come close to spending the amount of money that's asked for. These are just projected totals. Um, so this is just, you know, we anticipate we might spend 80,000, but then we do have. Money and savings sometimes maybe goes over, um, and the board or the treasury will adjudicate whether to approve spending as above or as approved here. So, those are the totals, and thank you guys for listening. Thank you. So, now we have any questions about these numbers or the budget. Uh, again, ideally, if you have questions, please go to the microphone back. There's one down here as well. So, if everybody can hear you, I'm happy to take your questions about our numbers. Cindy. Don't worry, it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for the details and everything. I'm just going to mention this one secret from the PM scratch really quickly. My suggestion is there's a very good chance since we have one more year, only one more year doing virtual, where our expenses have been proven to go down. Revenues would be a really nice surprise that guide week. Thank you. Brought in so much. Assuming the guide week is almost all virtual or all virtual, take all those new people that saw that and share that list with the Apple Awards. And possibly, the, in other words, the risk of you know prospects. I think that could increase significantly the revenue. I could be wrong, but we're talking people from around the states and country who like awards and stuff, especially where they could stay home in the jams and see all these people. So that could be a way at some point to rearrange that. And I think we have one year virtual and we really got to learn about that. Thank you. Yes, we, we do certainly intend to use the um, 
contacts who may be guided for uh, our benefit uh, over the next year. Um, yes, any other questions? I don't know. That's the microphone right down there. Okay, so I have two uh, brief questions. One is, uh, what is the difference of, on the education committee? You had FAM tour expenses and FAM tour bus expense. I'm just curious, what is the, di the difference actually between those two? Because most FAM tours, I understand, are members getting a voluntary tour. Sure, uh, that's a good question. So, what is a FAM tour expense that is a bus? Um, that would be like for the Newark trip. Um, we had to uh, spend money on um, donations and things like that, yeah. or uh, that we're not honorarians to people, but we're basically, I don't know if the mission is the right word, but you know, the Newark yeah. campus went to a number of venues yeah. and we gave money. Okay. No, or, or uh, you know, for, um, you know, sometimes there will be extra expenses on the, uh, the fam tour. Like I know, for instance, it's just a random example, not this fiscal year, but I have done fam trips in the past where we I pay for or the organization paid for ferry rides. That's not a bus. That kind of rides is too expensive. Okay. Thank you. And then the other question I have is when it came to non-committee income. Uh, this is because I I've been around a lot of them. In the past we had in-person meetings whenever there's not a member who's had troubles of some kind, we usually pass a hat and call that a mesh fund. Mm -hmm. And you had to indicate that somehow in the budget. So is that in that is that really considered this money? That's in the house. Yeah, that would be um that would be miscellaneous income. See, we're here where it says um non-committee income, miscellaneous income. That is that line item is always what we kind of just you shoved the match box into. Now we did not do anything with that in this past this year, which is why it's the last thing. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, is he telling you? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, just to clarify something. If you have to back out of a fan tour because you got a tour short notice, uh, isn't the, the fee way you got that? No. Well, I, 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 and I will tell you why. Because let's say you were registered for a fan tour and the last minute you got a, a tour date. It, this is just me speaking as the treasurer and someone who was on the education committee. That does not absolve you of your primary responsibility to respect the time of a person giving that fan tour and the commitment you made to take that tour. Um, and our attitude is just sometimes we get this, this number one reason for the record that people do cancel. Uh, or at the last minute, and they'll say, Oh, I got a gig. I'm like, Okay, $25 is what we have, and I think that's great. Uh, I, I, I'm not trying to be good about that. Uh, I really am not. But, but you, you know, when you know, I know when somebody puts one of my tours in those shows, I, I, I feel like this person just a second and they waste my time, and nobody in the tourism industry should be doing that to a fellow guy. Now, again, if you got the gig at the last minute, awesome, we're happy for you, but you have to accept the fact that the cost of doing that is that $25 that you made off that tour is going to have to go to a cancellation. Um, and what I you know, tell people is like, well, I, you know, some people don't believe they should pay a notion of the other circumstances, which I would say, do not register for the family. Right. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to do it, but, you know, um, uh, we have. You know, we had um, had times where guys have volunteered to give a fan tour, and I forget what the circumstances was, but like they anticipated, like, I forget it was one tour where half the people registered didn't show, and I think that and you know the, the guy had come to me afterwards and said, if I had known I was only going to get three people were going to show up, I wouldn't have bothered. So that's you know a great example why we do this. We're all Professionals again, our ideal revenue from that is zero dollars. So, if you, if you get a lot of last minute bookings, one awesome, I would love that uh, myself. Um, if you get a lot of last minute bookings, then maybe think twice before you sign up for certain professionals. So that's just what I say about that. Any other questions? Um, 
Kalau kita lihat kisah zaman dia yang datang sama Pak Oh iya, Oh iya, Pak Oh iya, Tips or duties are encouraged for band for guys, are they not? Yes. yes. So when uh, obviously uh, other than some of the ones that involve logistics like the trip, we don't charge members money for band tours. That is a benefit of your membership. Uh, you know, it's part of what we get from end use is access to these great events. Although we always encourage you to provide your duties and tips to guys giving that. Um, and it's another reason why, frankly, it's not fair to you know show up band tour. Somebody's expecting people to come and again, half the people or something no people no no show. You you know that's you know again tour guys should never be asked to give up their time for nothing. Uh so under very limited circumstances for all professionals. I'm Kevin. I just want to mention and remind people if you can cancel your your registration one day in advance. So the two days. Forty days. Forty hours. Eight hours, but still, you can go into wild after class. You control this yourself. So, yes, you might get a lot of last minute, but if you get something three days beforehand, you still don't are not going to be charged. For this. Yeah, 48, if it's 48 hours or more, um, yeah, obviously, that's slow when you can't that yourself. I mean, I've had a couple times this year where someone comes to me and like, uh, you know, not I'm feeling under the weather or there's a you know, family emergency, and I can come in. I would, uh, for, for cases, unless. My spidey sense goes off, and then someone be guessing me if somebody had a medical or any emergency. I will always leave it under these circumstances. I don't want people to feel like, you know, mom's in the hospital, but you still got to go to the family. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike. All right, and that is it um, for that. Um, uh, what was Michael? What was uh, the. Okay. Only uh, two of my only full members can vote. Okay. And if the people who are present here, I'm going to leave you for the line. I'm going to be registered. But by a show of hands, um, do you need a formal motion? Do you want formal motion? Yes. Do I so move? <laughs> I second. That we adopt the 2021-22 fiscal year budget as proposed. I second it. Second. Okay. So, uh, so if you are a full member and you are if you are a full member and you are in favor of that motion, please raise your hand at this time. Okay. If you uh, uh, bring those hands down. Uh, if you are a full member and you oppose the motion, please raise your hand. Okay, the motion appears to carry. Okay, um, so I'll turn it back over to uh, to John. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much. So the budget, the full budget, will be posted online. So um, in the member section under the documents, the full budget will be there. So everyone who goes through it, all the numbers are there, and you can you can have a look for yourselves. So with that, let's do the bulk of our meeting right now. Oh, meeting is is complete. Um, we're a little over time, John. I move that we adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay, so <laughs> all those in favor of adjourning are in the meeting. Uh, well, thank you all so much for coming.